Right. Well, it's five minutes after two, and we have until a quarter to three. I've been told that as the chairperson, I should be sure to limit all comments made by the panelists to two minutes. So both Sherwin and I are going to be very ferocious in limiting comments, but we do welcome comments first from the panel uh, for a discussion. Shall we, shall, we start, shall we start on this side? And before you begin, can I ask, would you like to answer each question or each comment in turn or no. collect? Yeah, collect? Collect. We'll collect two or three. I was just wondering, uh, I, I think, if I heard you correctly, Rachel, uh, that you said that uh, free, free people, I don't know if you'd use the term free people, the free don't need mysticism. Uh, I'm inclined to agree so long as what counts as being unfree, what counts as shackles, uh, more than the obvious overt oppressions, uh, would you think that the banality of contemporary life, or at least what seemed a, a banal life up until a month or so ago, uh, might be the sort of unfreedom that would motivate mysticism? I would say that different periods need new responses. We cannot adopt the response of the past in order to answer the need of the present. I don't deny that the existential constraints of the present are quite, quite severe. But it's not freedom that we are denied, it's other things that we are lacking. Thus, we don't need necessarily mysticism. We need new quest of spirituality. But it's upon us to create this new spiritual answer. Do you want to come back? Well, I, I, well, I would just want is, a clarification is this new kind of spirituality would have to be such that it would not meet a definition of mysticism that you would accept and if that's so what would you make out of the phenomena that uh, Joe spoke about uh, it looks like some of that has the imaginative attempts to blur lines and to imaginatively put oneself into a different reality, which comes close to what you said is mysticism. It looks like that's what's going on. How do you explain the, the what looks like the absurdance of the, these sorts of phenomena? As far as I'm concerned, mysticism has to play like it's a tennis game between the past and the present. Current mysticism dropped the past out. For me, Jewish mysticism is a play between the well of the past through language and the needs of the future and the present. If you dismiss the past, the language, the library, that is a different spirituality, but Jewish mysticism, it is not. Uh, you, should, you should know before I, I say what I say that I've, I've known of uh, Rachel's work for a long time. I have great admiration for it uh, and have great admiration for her as a scholar. I, I want you to know that as background because I think in this case I'm going to say I, I think I disagree about most of the things you said. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but, but I say that uh, bowing to your uh, expertise in the area and not in any way wanting to call question on that. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe time will give us to develop something that, that I really profoundly disagree with you about. Um, since we only have two minutes, uh, <laughs> no, you'll hit 15. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it symbolically through something you said at the beginning and let that open up discussion uh, uh, later. You, 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 so this is, this is a symbol of the general tenure of the things I want to raise with you as objections. Uh, you started out by using a metaphor of the atom in which you had the atom as a round thing with little things going around with that. That's wrong. That is what atoms are like. Uh, Niels Bohr developed a model like that uh, for, for what an atom is and then discovered it's wrong. It's just not what atoms are like. Uh, 
The reason the atoms can't be like that is because of quantum mechanics. What's, what's wrong with that image of the atom is you have things occupying definite places at definite times, and the particles, subatomic particles, don't occupy definite places in definite times. So what an atom really looks like is more like a uh, cloud, a somewhat spherical, fuzzy cloud, because an atom isn't really anywhere at any time. Now, that defies a view of reason if you presuppose reason as being definite things occupying definite places at definite times, which was a model of atomism that became dominant in Western science at a, shortly after the French Revolution. If that's your model of rationality, then the model of the universe that comes from quantum mechanics is an irrational model. But it's not an irrational model. There's nothing irrational about it at all. You just have to change your model, and you change your way of thinking about it, come up with a different model based not on certainty thinking, but on probability thinking, and you have something that, with the shift in model, is perfectly rational. I'm going to have to stop you, if I may. One sentence more? One sentence more. OK. That's what Kabbalah does to Jewish philosophy at the time of the Zohar, and in no way is Kabbalah an irrational movement. Okay. Is Kabbalah an irrational movement? Not irrational? No. no. OK. <laughs> okay. Not to define rationalism. Rationalism is what we can grasp with our mind or what we can judge to be of empirical truth. Nothing in Kabbalistic literature could be judged according to empirical truth because there is no empirical expression to it. Thus, it's on our imagination and mind. Now, how do we work what's rational? Rational is what's acceptable to us, what we consider to be worthwhile and truth. If the whole Kabbalistic literature is about the hidden world, how can we judge it rationally? When I would say that the Kabbalists in the 13th century claim that God is male and female, they call it Chatan Vekala, Kuchabrihu and Shchinte the male side and the female side. Is that rational for observant Jews? No, it's irrational. It's very rational for mystical Jews. Why do they do that? Because they want to reinvent God in human shape. This is a profoundly human experience, but rational it is not necessarily. If God of law is the rational God, God of mysticism is the irrational God. Now, we may want to know more about our irrational need to depict the divinity as male and female, but I don't think that that necessarily constitutes rationality. That constitutes imaginative reinterpretation. God in the Bible is only a voice. It is not male nor female. But in the Jewish mysticism, it is recreated. Now, if I may bring a very small example, Shabbat is a law. Shabbat is part of the Ten Commandments, as you know. Let's say that it is rational because it is a divine law. However, mysticism claims that Shabbat is the incarnation of the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is not a biblical phenomenon. That's a post-biblical, thousand years later phenomenon. Is that rational or is that irrational? Saying that Shabbat is about the unification of the Shekhinah and the Kutsha Brichu. Is that rational? Not necessarily. This is belief. This is imaginative reinterpretation. So we need to be very careful about our definition of rationality and irrationality. And first and foremost, we must agree that there is no such a thing as frozen Judaism. Judaism is an ongoing process which redefine all its elements. It's an ongoing process which redefine its textual heritage, its legal heritage, its imaginative heritage, and all of that together is what I meant by the circles of the atom around us. You know, we, in any historical given time, we are, let's say, a, a center, and around us there are many options, many 
echoes, many languages, many books, many ritual and uh, minhagim, many ritual and many customs that could facilitate a new Jewish life. We are free to pick from them whatever we want. Right. I, I'm sure Norbert will want to come back, but we better go on. Dan. Dan. I, I've had a, a strange experience uh, listening to your talk. I told you when you returned that I thought it was wonderful. The strangeness is that I consider myself anything but a mystic and anything but even interested in mysticism. And yet, I was fascinated by your your approach because it give, gives me, and I think it gives a person who takes a rational approach, a window into an entire world of experience that we might otherwise feel uh, is foreign to us. And because I think your, your point that it is the human existential situation of the human beings involved that either calls forth their mystical response or doesn't because they don't need it, which is, I think, a very helpful, maybe a profound way of looking at a great deal of human uh, creativity. But it occurs to me, and this is not in the form of a question, it's in the form of a comment, and perhaps you can comment on my comment. The comment is that it would appear to me that given your understanding, Christianity and Islam would be alternative fictions, just as Jewish mysticism is an elaborate fiction. So are Christian and Islamic uh, uh, mysticisms. And, and if halakha and mysticism are the alternative ways of dealing with experience, the rational halakha, rational versus the mystical, uh, what is the corresponding uh, alternative in Islam and especially in Christianity. Thank you. Those are not opposites, those are dialectical poles, halachai, dagada, or law and mysticism. In the Jewish context versus to the Christian one, the binding pole is the halachic pole, or the literal level of the text, the legal heritage. That's the reason the Jews kept to their legal tradition for so long. Only those who held to the legal binding tradition were free to play with their imagination in the mystical, in the mystical arena. Thus, if you don't hold to the first one, you are not free to the second one. Because of that, and only because of that, Christianity was dismissed, not because of its content, but because Christianity dismissed of the law, they were denied the freedom of the legendary part of it. The Jewish precondition was always, if you, do what you, if you do what you are told, you are completely free to think what you wish, and not other way. You are not free to do what you want. You are bind, you're bound to do what you are told by the law, by the community, by the heritage. And then, and only then, you are completely free thinker. You can contemplate, interpret, rewrite, rethink, do whatever you want, as long as you comply to that. If I may, one more sentence. I want to bring a classical example of the basic text of Jewish mysticism, the non-compensatory mysticism. If the chariot mysticism is a compensation of pain and loss, I'd like to bring another example for non-compensatory mysticism. The book of creation, Sefer Yetzirah, was written about 2,000 years ago in the days that the temple was still standing. It starts that following. It says, when God Almighty chose to create the world, he created it with 32 passes of wisdom. Why 32? 22 letters and 10 digits. By Sefer, Mispar, Vesipur. By book, number, and narrative. By letters, by numbers, by narrative. Now this is a wonderful story of creation. It's an addition on Genesis. Because in the Genesis creation story, we are not there and we do not share in the process of creation. In the book of creation, in Sefer Yetzirah, we are sharing by the new mystical interpretation with the process of creation because we also 
shared those 32 passes of wisdom, 22 letters, and 10 numbers. Because those are the foundation of the human spirit. If God created the world with letters and numbers, we may participate in the process of creation. Maybe not with that gift, maybe not to that extent, and with that gift and the talent, but we are also part of the creative process. Because of that, it's called Sefer Yetzirah. That's an example of what you do with mystical reinterpretation. You enlarge the meaning of human participation. You enlarge the meaning of human existence. You deepening the dialogue between man and God. You deepening the dialogue between what's possible and what's impossible. Uh, uh, just a, a footnote and then a question, if I may, Rachel. Um, you and I said we would find some way to respond to Joe Schumann since we were denied that. So uh, a little synthesis here. Uh, you said that uh, the word religion is not found in the Bible, and that's true. Uh, there, is a, uh, there are 27 documents which are an extension of the Bible, um, um, called unfairly by the world in which I work, the New Testament. But one of those documents is the Epistle of James, which is the most Jewish of all the 27 documents in that collection. Uh, and it does indeed use the word religion. Uh, um, and it goes this way, religion that is undefiled before God is this, to care for the widow and the orphan. And that made me think of the things that Joe Schumann was saying. Now my question. Um, you, you said, I, I believe, what we cannot do in worship we will do in prayer. Uh, for those of us who um, do not cannot or will not pray in any sense of the word pray, where does that leave us? When I said what we cannot do in worship, we can do in prayer, that is of course not our present situation, it was the past situation. It was the past situation where the temple was destroyed and no sacrificial work was uh, possible. Prayer was devised as exchange of it. Now, I think that if we can conclude anything from that, we should say, what is our answer to the question? You know, Buber used to say that God is called all the time to men and say, where are you? Okay, that's the God of Buber. Where are you, human being? What's your answer? Now, it's upon us to answer in our way, in our perception, where are we? Are we in charity? Are we in communal responsibility? Are we in education? Are we in creative new books? Are we in creative new spirituality? It's not a limited thing. It's an open thing. The question is, are we part of a dialogue where we are asked, where are we? Or to whom do we pray? To what subject do we want to be in dialogue with? And I think that that line of thought might be an answer to the question. Well, we haven't yet heard from Sherwin, so I think you should have an opportunity to respond to. Um, I too, like Dan, was fascinated by your presentation. And uh, I thought it was very creative. I have uh, two problems. One is the distinction between chok and mysticism, between halakha and mysticism. The assumption is that halakha is rational and mysticism is irrational. My experience, a lot of the halakha, <laughs> is that it's hopelessly irrational. I mean, if you look at most of the laws in what I would call the uh, orthodox smorgasbord, uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, the treatment of women, the response to menstrual blood, even the dietary laws, to refer to them as rash, I mean, it, it's a facile distinction. It's not, not appropriate. And the second thing is, I, I got from your talk that it's a kind, that mysticism is a kind of harmless imagining. On the contrary, fantasy can have consequences on behavior. We know all kinds of people who have fantasies who what, act on the basis of their fantasy. An example, during the time of Shabtai Tzvi, the false messiah, um, in the 17th century, thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews sold their property, <laughs> left their homes, uh, destroyed their existing lives on the basis of this imagining. And recently in Israel, 
a man whom I detest, Ovadja Yosef, used the theory of transmigration of souls for political purposes. Uh, he said, uh, indeed, the people who died in the Holocaust deserved it because the people who died in the Holocaust were the reborn souls, well, well, he didn't say that outwardly, but he implied it, were the reborn souls of wicked people who had been reborn in this life, and therefore the punishment they received was indeed justified. What I'm saying is, imagining is not idle. Imagining has consequences. And in, in fact, it may have a consequence if it's sufficiently fantastic to produce passivity in people because they imagine they're going to get miraculous rescues. It takes them far away from reality. Well, I can completely agree with your comments. We are in complete agreement, only it's a bit of a shift that I would like to, to suggest. What is rational? Rational is only what we agree that is rational. I want to remind all of us, it was completely rational to beat women in the legal system of most Western countries. It was completely legal to prevent women to go to school in England. Virginia Woolf was not allowed to go to school in the 20th century. Completely rational. It was completely rational to discriminate Jews. It was completely rational. So the law is rational not because of its content, because it's agreed to be the rational tools of a certain time. Just as we said in the great Japanese movie, pornography is a matter of geography. We may say rationality is a matter of changing time and place. I certainly don't want to offer rational reasoning for the 613 commandments. Many of them do not serve our rational judgment. However, at their day, and at their time, they were perceived completely rational. They were not irrational. They were rational, and they served most important purpose. Menstrual blood was part of a system of assuring pregnancy and assuring continuity of life. Not eating that and, be, and eating this was part of borders of segregation and separation of a community in action. We can explain everything. At the time, it had perfect rational. The question is whether this rationale is applicable to us. Nowadays, that's entirely a different ballgame. But at the time, it was rational. So law was rational in its inception, and rationality was lost in the, co in the course of the generation. Now to the other part of the comment. Mysticism could be very effective. I don't wish to say otherwise. Of course, it could be very effective. And I said it's a significant branch of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I said evil it could be. Now, I don't think that the Sabbatites V example is evil, because what's wrong in selling all your properties? You know, they made a great change in the, uh, in the, land, in the uh, real estate market. That's not evil. However, <laughs> but. <laughs> But let, let me say it the other way around. If there would not have been Sabbatai Tzvi, it's a great question whether Zionism would grow out of it. Sabbatai Tzvi is a leader of the messianic dream. And the messianic dream is that reality could be alternated, that there could be an alternative reality. That is what Zionism was about. And if there would not be a pre-messianic banner, there would be no Zionism and its consequences. I think, and I'm positive, that mystical games can have very profound effect. However, they don't have a profound effect because they are rational. They have a profound effect because they are irrational, because they are challenging borders of rationality. Rationality should not be hailed uncritically. We should remember that what was completely rational to us was not necessarily completely rational to our forefathers and foremothers, and vice versa. What was completely rational to them is not rational to us. I'm sure many of you remember that there was time that it was very rational not to feed a crying baby, because only every four hours you were allowed, and not otherwise. Nowadays, it seems cruelty 
It was completely rational not to allow certain people to do certain things. It was part of rationality. But that was the law. So law and rationality are equated in certain historical circumstances. So we should not misjudge the rationality of the law. We should ask historically what it was talking with and how it was affected. Okay. Right. I, I'm sure Sherwin would want to respond, but we must move on. Joseph. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I want to thank Professor Elior for an incredibly rich presentation. It was really marvelous. And of course, I don't know if people noticed that you, you gave that entire discourse without looking at your notes, which I thought was really, really quite extraordinary. I think your students at the Hebrew University are really, their lives are really embellished, I think, tremendously because of, they have you as a teacher. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Just one comment and then uh, a small question. Uh, in terms of a comment, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, that Judaism does not have a word for religion, and neither do most other religions. Um, our understanding, and that includes my analysis that I gave, is really very, it derives from Christianity more than anything. The Christians, especially when they sent out missionaries, modeled or forced a type of template onto other religions which they did not, under, did not have in their own self-understanding. I mean, when the missionaries came to India and they said, well, every religion has to have a, a, a scripture, the, you know, the Hindus were just doing their thing, and indeed they had to say, well, the Vedas are our scripture, or whatever. I mean, all those categories that we understand in terms of religion, having a liturgy, having a worship, having rituals, having, um, having a scripture, all of that is really imposed by a type of Christian way of understanding religion. And I think it's important to know that, and it's particularly, and this has nothing to do with the professor's talk, with our understanding of what's going on in Islam today. Um, I think that, again, the notion of religion and those Christian categories have been imposed on the Islamic world in a way in which they may not, in their own self-understanding of what they're doing, indeed have. And therefore, we may draw certain stereotype notions of how Muslims respond in an authoritarian way to their scripture. And I think it's important for us to try to get beyond those stereotype notions of religion, especially in these dangerous times, and particularly our stereotype notion of Islam, which is where the political stakes are so high, to realize that there are 1.2 billion Muslims in the world, and how they understand and appreciate their religion is dependent on circumstances, political, economic, and otherwise, that may not have anything to do with what we understand to be those religious categories. Just as Islam has been at times very authoritarian, at other times it's been relatively tolerant, Christianity and Judaism both have their liberal dimensions as well as their very reactionary ones, and how they sort of transmute themselves are not due to the religion itself, but the context in which the religion is interpreted. And I think that that's getting beyond stereotype thinking in these, ter in these times where stereotypes can lead to so much um, knee-jerk uh, political I'm response. I'm going to have very to stop important. you if I may. Oh, okay, I did have one short question. Just very please. Brief. Very brief. 12 seconds. Okay. You, well. you, ju you opposed uh, rationality with mysticism, and yet one might look at, and it's debatable, Spinoza as a Jewish thinker, and certainly, and even as a mystic, where he talks about the intellectual love of God and seeing the world re through reason, which takes on God's standpoint as type, being a type of mystical experience and union, and yet clearly he uses reason as the vehicle by which to get to that point. So yeah. there's an example, I think, of where rationality can be used in the service of the mystical and not necessarily yeah. diametrically opposed to it. So um, that's just If I may, I'll, I'll get, we'll have two more comments and then give you a chance right. to uh, wrap up. Okay, Raquel, uh, Ruth. Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Rachel. It's amazing to watch you speak English, and I, I hear the Hebrew all the time, too. And you do it so amazingly. Thank you. Two little comments. One is about uh, the playfulness. It is so strong, and I think, what is this that, that does not let us be playful? It is so difficult to stay playful when you grow up, when you're in academia, especially. So, so few people still play at all, and how we do that to the children, how we kind of make them dry slowly, get all the moist out and they stop playing. And really I think everything that is important in, in culture happens 
when one is playing, whether with atoms or with uh, words. So that, was, that is a big idea of playfulness. It, it seems so easy, but it really is not. But, and it has this kind of uh, paradox of be spontaneous. The minute you think about it, there's no way you can be playful or fall asleep when you want to. And uh, that's a big question for me. The other w thing I wanted to say, uh, a little thing to share in about the Rav Avadia Yosef. I like Rav Avadia Yosef, <laughs> and I enjoy him. And I think he has the problem of like, when you receive email, and it's from someone you're not used to talking to, you can never tell, especially in English for me, if they're joking, if they are sweet to you, or if they are stabbing you. There's no way to know, because it's only the letters and no music. Rav Avadia Yosef is a performer. For, in my eyes, he's one of the better uh, stand-up uh, comedians there are in our time. <laughs> and when you think in a Sephardic way of thinking, when you come to the Shabbat portion in synagogue, he is not there. He is political, for sure. And he has, I mean, he is worth his, I don't know how to speak, say it in a Shabbat, a Kesef Shelo in Hebrew. He is worth, uh, there's a lot to fight him about. But I think when he's using his words, his vocabulary, and his culture, sometimes we are just missing jokes. And what, I, what you said here was a big thing in Israeli newspapers. Uh, and this was, I believe, one of the times that he did not deserve what he sometimes does uh, deserve to I, get. I'm going to have to stop you, if I may. I would like, Rega, there was something important. <laughs> ah, to Rachel, just a What's minute. I study Midrash, and you, you are uh, specialized in Kabbalah. And the way you described it, it was uh, as if it is almost the same thing, Midrash and Agadah and Kabbalah, because it's playful and because it's reinterpreting something classic to new life. I would say that the difference between Midrash and Kabbalah that is strong in my eyes is still a different wavelength of Kabbalah. Midrash is looking straight in the, in the simple little things of life, and they're interested in, they're looking in your eye. Kabbalah usually looking very high up to all kinds of things that are not our usual cups and salt and pepper. And I think in that, even, even if they're doing the same kind of procedure, it's very different. Yeah. Okay, and Andre. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, there's a couple of, I don't have questions, but I have some methodological criticism. And it, it, it comes from not anything I know, but the way I think. You said something this morning, and I think you've, you've been saying it again in your talk, uh, and it boils down to this, is that mysticism is born out of the hardships and the despair of a, of a nation. And, uh, and it's a, it provides me with what I call a hydraulic model. In other words, if you put too much pressure on a, on a people or on a psyche, Freud, or on anything, something is going to give out. It's going to seep out in a different direction. Uh, it's a very attractive model, though I don't know that it really works and it really happens the way you say it. In other words, um, when the present is horrible, we sort of take refuge in mysticism and imagination. It sounds good. Um, I don't know that you can prove it. I don't know that I believe it, honestly. Um, and I'm, I'm usually suspicious of these sort of um, well-framed um, ideas because they kind of do not allow opposite versions of them to come into play. Um, and which takes me to the second one, is that you, 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 you sort of exaggerate, because I don't know, the idea that there is freedom to think. Yeah. That there is a freedom to think. No. Um, you do not exaggerate. No, it. I no. Um, I, I've never believed that any culture encourages the freedom to think, <laughs> especially if you if you have a freedom to think and to say what you think. Uh, to think in one's bathroom is one thing, but if I can only think it there, it's of no. Um, in other words, but can I say it to people? I mean, that's the one thing, when you say there's freedom to think, and that is mysticism, that the religious tradition allows us to do that, uh, that's okay. But then if you cannot say it, and you can, if you can certainly not act on it, then it might as well never have been thought. 
Okay. Uh, well, okay. and that's that's where I'll yeah. stop. And if you would like to make one final uh, comment and, and possibly respond to these points, then we must stop. I'll try. Okay. I'll start from the end. Judaism was about complete freedom of thought with no inhibitions. This is one of its unique traits, and when I say freedom of thought, it's freedom of writing your thought. Never you were told not to write this and that and that, as long as you're part of the abiding community who follows the law. There were no restriction of thought. In all the, uh, in all the credos and in all the uh, classical books, all through the Middle Ages, they say you may think and write what your, so what your thoughts are as free as you wish, as long as you do not debate about following the law. So that, that to begin with. You may disagree with the, what you call the hydraulic model. I would just say that this is not the only model. I don't wish to say, and I brought the example of the Book of Creation as the non-hydraulic model, okay? Not every mystical writing is a result of pain. However, majority of mystical writings could be associated directly to the pains of existence and to the desper desperate experience of the writers who were denied any other source of free expression and freedom and equality. So literature was, I call it, the playground of imagination and freedom where any kind of other freedom was denied. The other thing, uh, to Ruth's comment about the difference and equality between Midrash and Kabbalah. They are affiliated members, they are not identical. Why they are affiliated? Because they're both about hermeneutical freedom. The difference between them is that Midrash is always working on one small segment. They would be interpreting one word, one sentence, one chapter. They never have a whole agenda. Kabbalah is vice versa. Kabbalah has a whole agenda, and then they're doing the interpretative uh, interpretive uh, effort. So first they have, let's say, the messianic idea, then they would do the hermeneutics, okay? First they have the chaotic experience versus the structured divine world, then they would do the, uh, the interpretive, ex interpretive experience. They are looking upwards and far away and complicated as far as possible in order to secure the predeterministic course of history that would result, that would come as a result of these deep introspections and deep uh, contemplations. About the playfulness, I would like to accentuate it time and again, and, uh, and even to try to engage you and think about that way. What is playfulness with word? If you'll take a word like Shoshanata Amakim, which literally would be translated as the rose of the valleys. However, in Hebrew, being a non-punctuated language, you can read it, the word Shoshana, which is a rose, yes. you can read it, the one which is transformed, Shemishtana, Sheshona. What is Amakim? Instead of valleys, that would be the depths of. So they would, instead of reading Shoshanata Amakim, they would say the transformation of the depths. Now, they don't say that this is literal. They know very well it's not literal, but they are not interesting in the literal. They are interesting in the possible deep meaning of every word, suggesting that the language is infinite and holy, and holiness means being infinite in its meaning. That more and more meanings could be derived and could be deciphered from the same old text. They are rereading and rewriting from the very same textual uh, heritage new writings and new thought, and there are no limits on that. No one can say to, him, to another uh, writer, you are wrong. Shoshanata Amakim should not be called the transformation of death. You cannot say you are wrong exactly as you cannot say your dream is wrong, my dream is right. This is from the inner world, from the po 